Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. Think it... Oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I am your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everyone, and once again, may I welcome you to this, our fine podcast. My name is W.J. Sheehan, author of the series of books, Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters, volumes one through nine, available at Amazon in paperback and ebook, and volumes one through eight at Audible, iTunes, and Amazon as well. So do partake of a book or two, and show some support for what we're doing here. Before I bring my brother in, I'd like to thank everyone out there for your well wishes for my wife, Paula. She's going through a situation now, and I ask that all of you who have a mind to do so to pray for her. Simple, isn't it? And effective. And now, may I introduce you to my brother and co-host, KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you? I'm doing great, Bill. It's good to be back together on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. How'd you make out in that regatta, that weekend regatta? Oh, it was good. I was actually, uh, I wasn't driving the boat in this one. I was helping somebody out that's new to our local fleet. So I was crewing for him. So oh, a little break cool. in the action. Yeah, it kind of helps someone else out, help someone new out. Doing a little instructing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> awesome, and as man. As my as my new friend learned, it was a humbling experience for him. He <laughs> he came and he was like, "Well, you know, I just want to be in the top third of the fleet." And I was like, "Yeah, you better uh, you better relax a little bit. This is your first regatta." <laughs> well, so, by the way, what did the poor bloke finish? He might have been second to last overall, but <laughs> at least he wasn't last. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what they say, second place is the first loser. Exactly. <laughs> but, uh, they say on Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby, second place, first loser. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, Kev. Now, the audience doesn't know that you and I both uh, like F1 racing. Yeah. And uh, you remember me telling you that one of the uh, NASCAR guys a couple of years ago commented on uh, the placement of the two uh, Mercedes drivers. And by the way, folks, Mercedes has dominated this F1 for the past five or six years. Uh, They continually finish first and second most of the time. Yeah, not so much this year, though. The other teams are catching up, I think, this year. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Things are turning around. But at the time, the NASCAR driver said about... uh, Hamilton, when he finished second in one of the races, that he, yeah, he finished second in a two car race. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, what do you got today, bro, in our cryptids in the news and other oddities? Yeah, so this week, Bill, we're going with some straight news. Um, I came across an inter- interesting article that was in uh, Popular Mechanics. Wow. Um, a while back and uh, not too long ago. I mean, this year. And it's interesting, though. It's it's entitled Could Bigfoot Really Be Out There? And it goes through a little bit of uh, some research on different things through time that we know about and a couple of things that were kind of new to me, especially a couple of uh, Native American legends. So I figured we'll go through there. And for some of the folks that are new to the podcast, We'll get to talk about a couple of things that we've talked about in the past a bit um, and then uh, move on to some new things as well. 
Excellent. You know, it's like yeah. I always say, Kev, there's always people new to this. Not everybody knows what we know or have discussed. Right. So this, right. this, and this is be- kind of cool because it comes from popular mechanics, right? So it's a, you know, pretty prestigious publication. Um, yeah, I figured somebody in popular mechanics, I thought somebody might have saw one putting a water pump in an F-150 out in the woods. <laughs> 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 Could be. It wasn't in this article, but I'll keep looking. <laughs> they gotta, they gotta watch themselves when they're snugging up bolts on a motor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so th- so this article anyway by Matt Blitz. His name is like the Blitz is on. Um, he ta- he starts out talking about the most famous video footage of Bigfoot ever, right, Bill? The Patterson-Gimlin film, or what we uh, affectionately call the Patty film, uh-huh. which, was, which, of course, was shot in 1967, October of 1967, in some of the heavily wooded forests of Northern California, right, which is definitely a hotbed of, uh, of uh, Bigfoot sightings throughout time. Even yeah, back no, before 1967. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it continues. Right, right. And uh, so this author goes and he talks to uh, Bob Giblin. And he, he Bob Giblin talks about the fact that he knows exactly what he saw that day. You know, of course, we've seen the film. And if folks out there haven't seen the film, go to YouTube. There's a bunch of different versions of it, the the original, some that have been digitally enhanced, some that folks have zoomed in on and things like that, tons of video analysis. But this author, he goes and he talks to Gimlin, and uh, Gimlin says, you know, it walked upright for quite a long ways. It definitely wasn't a bear. Of course, we know that, Bill, after seeing the video, definitely not a bear. (laughs) And um, Gimlin talks about the fact that, you know, he's been in the woods his whole life, which we know that, right? You know, when he was out there with Roger Patterson, they're on horseback and we're in the woods for days, which was a normal thing for them. And Gimlin ends up saying, there's no doubt in my mind at all uh, what it was that I saw that day. Yeah, I mean, you know our feelings about it. I mean, it's unquestionably, (laughs) excuse me, a Bigfoot creature uh, that they caught on film, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And then he starts to talk about, the author starts to talk about and write about some of the Native American cultures that have both written and oral legends that tell of, you know, some type of primate-like creature, the hairy man roaming the forests of uh, North America. And, um, you know, in he, he mentions that in some of these tales, uh, the animals are more like a human, right, Bill, the classic hairy man. Mm-hmm. And other times they're described to be more primate-like or ape-like, right? So mm-hmm. it's kind of interesting. And he also goes into it that, you know, in some of the legends, and he talks about this later on as well, that, you know, they're a friendly beast. I mean, not like Harry and Henderson's friendly, but, you know, kind of shy and uh, not aggressive at all, you know, just kind of watching. And then in other legends uh, and other accounts, the hairy man is quite uh, aggressive and even, you know, vicious, coming after people and hurting people. Yeah, well, you know, uh, one of the one of the greatest tales uh say, in the past hundred years was the one we spoke about at that fish cannery up north. Oh, yeah, up in Alaska. I, yeah, I mean, that guy, the the first murder or killing that took place, this creature took an extremely heavy, large piece of equipment, which I think was like a snowplow or something, and uh, killed the man by picking that up and throwing it at him or hitting him with it, something that's, you know, not fathomable for a human being to do. Yeah, some huge piece of logging equipment. I forget exactly what it was, but yeah, like as heavy and big as a snowplow. 
Yeah. So, yeah, just a super strength. So, you know, one of the legends that the author talks about um, is from the mythology of, now I'm going to mess up the pronunciation here, Bill, the Kwak Aoodle tribe, or K-W-A-K-I-U-T-L, uh, that once heavily populated the western coast of British Columbia. So this is another hotbed of sightings through time. We've reported on many of them. And in their legend, they have a creature that's called the uh, Zunaqua. So that's the best I can do. <laughs> and the Zunaqua <laughs> is a big, hairy female that lives deep in the mountainous forests. So I haven't heard of this one, Bill, before. Huh. Um but they say, according to this legend, this female creature spends most of her time protecting her children and sleeping. And that's why she's rarely seen by uh, anyone in the tribe, hmm. which is pretty interesting, right? Yeah, interesting that they identify basically explicitly with a female creature. Exactly. Very huh. much uh, always referred to as a female and taking care of her children. Wow. Which, of course, Patty was a female as well in the Patterson-Gimlin film. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about that. I mean, all you have to do is look and see a large breast hanging from the body, and, you know, that's what we identify females with, right, a breast. Exactly, exactly. And then he talks about, uh, the author talks about that in California, you know, we've seen these century-old pictographs that are drawn by the Yokuts, another Native American tribe, um, and they show a family of giant creatures with long, shaggy hair. Hmm. And the tribe calls them the Mayak Datat. Hmm. Um, and they say, you know, it, the images definitely look like the commonly held vision of a Bigfoot. Yeah, right, it's so. interesting. Yeah. I'd like to know what the Mayak Datat translates into. <laughs> Pro- probably means like something, run for your life, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> run faster than the Native American next to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think they were a little smarter than us when it comes to getting near vicious creatures. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. And then the author goes back and he talks about um, one of the most famous uh, sightings you know, in uh, the last hundred years or so, which was in 1924, and we reported on this, uh, where the uh, loggers, or the prospectors, sorry, were hiding in the cabin uh, up near Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and they were attacked in the night by a group of what they called ape men. And now we call that uh, area of the country Ape Canyon. In Mm. fact, they renamed it because of this. Hmm. Yeah. So we know that one, right? Yep, yep. Lots yep. of activity. You know, the uh, continuity of sightings and, and evidence and drawings and folklore and whatnot, it's just uh, these people didn't know each other. You know, yep. they were just, uh, for the record, putting down what they had seen in their time and in their place. They weren't communicating with iPhones or sending each other mail. Uh, you know, I, I can't see any way around it other than these these people had encounters with the freaking Sasquatch. Yep. And then it's pretty interesting. So get this. This is uh, something. I never heard about this either. And he, and he has a, a copy of the article here from 1895 from one of the periodicals, actually the San Francisco Chronicle that describes um, a guy who killed a giant grizzly bear that had been running around the region there uh, with the uh, miners and uh, uh, farmers um, for nearly 15 years. And what, what do you think this giant grizzly bear was called back in 1895? Wow, uh, Sasquatch. <laughs> Not Sasquatch, but big, <laughs> Bigfoot. Really? Yeah, yeah. That's so, funny. So get this. So I'll, I'm going to read the little article to you. So this is from 1895 in the San Francisco Chronicle. At Bald Rock, 60 miles from Fresno, California, John Rose killed a grizzly bear, which had been roaming around that region for nearly 15 years and was called Bigfoot by miners in that vicinity. 
It is estimated that he has killed 1,000 sheep in his time and has had many fights with Chinese sheep herders. He carried scars to show it, for when he was cut open, seven bullets were found in his carcass. They had been fired into him in past years. He was mm-hmm. killed in a canyon and could not, could not be brought out, but those who saw him estimated his weight at 2,000 pounds. Whoa. But I thought that wow. was interesting where here, you know, we always think of Bigfoot related to, you know, the hairy man. But here all the way back in 1895, uh, they had this giant grizzly out there that they called Bigfoot. Yeah, interesting. And, of course, you believe this was a giant grizzly bear. I would, too. I do. I do. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. Uh, obviously the guy's a hunter. And uh, if we're to stay true to form... Uh, These people know what they're looking at. If this guy said he killed a giant grizzly bear, it was a giant grizzly bear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, so he goes back, the author goes forward now in time into the mid-20th century when he talks about the fact that, uh, and this is still before the uh, Patterson-Gimlin film, where Bigfoot, you know, this creature, you know, stepped from local lore to national phenomena and he, he cites, Bill, one of our favorite uh, books, uh, uh, and he talks about in 1961 that the naturalist Ivan T. Sanderson published his now famous book, Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life. And mm-hmm. uh, folks, if you haven't gotten your hands on a copy of this book and you like uh, the cryptids, all kinds of cryptids, I mean, you go to the index of uh, Ivan Sanderson's book and you can find anything in there that we've ever talked about and stuff we haven't talked about yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the book, of course, Sanderson uses footprints from eyewitnesses, bone samples, uh, sightings, witness reports about the evidence that this creature is there, both in North America and uh, in the Himalayas, too, you know, with respect to the Yeti creature that we've often talked about. Yeah, and, and re- just a reminder, Kev, remember that book I was telling you about, The Long Walk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About that fella and a couple of uh, prisoners who escaped from Siberia. And uh, I won't get into it with you, but this is a true story. It's a, a biographical account. The last thing they ran across coming out of the Himalayas was two Bigfoot or two uh, Yetis. And uh, incredible. Again, once again, in this biography of misery and death and uh, turmoil, escaping with basically nothing but the clothes on their back, how they run into these two Yeti coming out of the Himalayas. That's, uh, you know... There's a lot more to this than meets the eye for people who have an open mind and a set of ears and eyes to see what's going on here, you know. Yep, yep. And then so that this this article wraps up with uh, some interesting analysis. So, uh, you know, he writes, the author writes that Sanderson's work caught enough people's attention that uh, a well-regarded primate evolutionary biologist at John Hopkins University named William Strauss reviewed um, Sanderson's work for Science Magazine. And get this, so it's interesting. He's very critical of Sanderson, but listen to how this ends. He says that Sanderson's standards for evidence are unbelievably low and that the evidence is anything but convincing to him. But, he writes, uh, nonetheless, he admits that it would be foolish and quite unscientific to say that the creatures Sanderson describes absolutely don't exist. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. You know, even this person who's a you know, a a well-known primate evolutionary biologist at Johns Hopkins University at the time, critical of Sanderson's research, but then says, hey, it would be foolish and unscientific for me to sit here and say that these creatures that he describes absolutely don't exist. How do I know? Right. Yeah. You know, when you read Sanderson's book, I, I understand what this guy from Johns Hopkins is talking about. And it's what a lot of people are talking about. They want every I dotted, every T crossed. All of this stuff done like you had a rolling laboratory 
going out into the woods all over the place. All of your interviews were done according to protocol, everything written out. You know, it, it just doesn't happen that way. Right. You, you know, right. you're gathering, you're doing the best you can, you're interviewing, you're going to scenes when able. It, it just does not happen that way. And that's why, thank you very much, I don't think we need the approval of all of these people to move forward in the query about Bigfoot. Yep. So. And then this author, the last thought I'll leave with you. So again, check this out um, in uh, Popular Mechanics Cool article. I, I just touched on some of the highlights, but the author of the article, he ends um, uh, by um, um, talking about Jane Goodall, the famed chimpanzee expert. And she, apparently at the time, said that there's a possibility for sure that an undiscovered large primate may exist in the world, which I think is interesting. You know, yeah. that somebody that spent that much time living and researching uh, primates, especially gorillas, um, you know, came out publicly and said, hey, there's definitely a possibility that there's some undiscovered large primate that exists in the world. Yeah, I mean, look how long it took them to run into the uh, silverback, right? Exactly. Uh, and that was, see, that was a scientific probe launched by an individual. I don't know what kind of backing she had uh, to investigate these reports. So to me, uh, again, not that we need them, but why isn't such an endeavor launched into the investigation of these Bigfoot encounters? Yep. You don't hear of it. So, yep. you know, there's some type of reason behind that, what it is. I'm not even going to venture a guess. But, you know, it could be done uh, if the powers that be uh, put their minds in their wallets into doing it. And we're honest about it. Full disclosure. And we know that's not going to happen because we're barely getting full disclosure on the UFO flap. Uh, and uh, I don't think you're going to get that where in regards to Bigfoot. Yeah. By the way, we should be hearing some of that uh, about some of that government report soon on UFOs. So, well, one report came out a while ago, and it was kind of bland. It was just kind of an ad admittance that uh, you know uh, we're aware of things that we can't explain. Uh, in yeah, there's airspace. supposed to be that bigger report coming out, though, you know, uh -huh. uh, from the government. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but but it's interesting. Let's let's see. Yeah, so we'll that's see. it, Bill. That's uh, cryptids in the news and other oddities this week. Good article in uh, Popular Mechanics from earlier this year. Yeah, check I hope, it out. I hope the Bigfoot uh, brought its core back to AutoZone. <laughs> 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 remember, remember, Bigfoot, the core is worth 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a pretty incredible tale to tell here. Uh, told to me by a fellow named Harry Lund Henry Lundquist, a resident of Concord, New Hampshire, Kev. Oh. And uh, this is what Henry had to share. It's a little lengthy, but well worth it. So stay with me. In answer to your query, Bill, I thought I'd contact you and add the facts concerning my own experience to your files. For a long time, I've had this on my mind and in my heart, and I'm actually quite happy to have someone who is actually interested in what I have to say about the events surrounding my own Bigfoot encounter. It was in 1983 that I had inherited my granddad's old hunting cabin and this having occurred after my father passed away. Now, as I begin, my granddad was the hunter in the family, with my father not exactly following in his footsteps. Nevertheless, both my father and I, as well as my granddad, had spent a fair amount of time at this cabin in northern Maine. The cabin was about as far north as you can get without entering Canada, being located east of Fort Kent, with the St. John's River to our north and the Allagash River due west of us. The cabin was not much of a structure, but was sturdily built by my granddad, who was a Norwegian carpenter. 
the cabin was 20 by 30 feet. And he'd actually gone to the trouble of building a fireplace in it, as well as having a hand pump uh, well drilled, which still works to this day. My father and granddad had also built two Volkswagen dune buggies, which they kept at the cabin. Having pulled the bodies off two old beetles, they had welded a tubular frame around the cars and added some large Cadillac rims and snow tires to them. Every time we went up there, we spent a fair amount of time getting them running again, and we used them to bomb around the woods, having a ball. One of the greatest things about this place was that you could virtually do whatever you wanted to do without fear of reprisal or anyone telling you to stop. I remember throwing all kinds of things into the air and blasting them with shotguns, fishing for trout, and generally having a good old time in the woods. At any rate, I will always remember my grandfather warning me, when I got older, if I ever became a hunter, I should never wander around up here alone, even with a gun. He never told me why, but one night while I was sleeping, I had awoken late with my dad and granddad being unaware that I was awake. As I lay there listening, the two of them were drinking beer, and my granddad was talking about a giant hairy beast that he had seen in the area while hunting. Then he and my dad were talking about repairs they had done to the cabin in previous years when I was too young to be there with them. To me, it was almost like listening to a ghost story as I lay there half asleep. Nevertheless, I was taking mental notes of all which was being said when finally I must have dozed back off. Well, as the years passed, my granddad had weakened with age and was no longer going to the cabin. My father really didn't possess the same zeal that my granddad had, and as fate would have it, we hadn't been to the cabin for over 12 years at the time of my dad's passing. So now the cabin was mine, as well as the guns that both the men had owned, which sat in my closet, having not been shot in years. At that point in my life, I was a single man, and my career path had wrangled me into auto parts sales for a major distribution company. During this time, I was regularly visiting many stores around the Northeast, promoting our line of parts and seeing that everyone was happy and well-stocked with inventory. It was during this phase of my life, if you will, that in the course of my BSing with everybody and their brother going from store to store, The subject had been breached with a fellow in Massachusetts about my having this cabin in northern Maine. Well, this guy was a hunter's hunter, and I was actually quite friendly with him. I always looked forward to my visits to his shop. At some point in time, he had said to me that he'd love to head up to the cabin with me if I ever felt led to do so. And so it was in the summer of 85 that he and I and another guy from his shop rode up north to spend a week there. Now, following in the footsteps of my granddad, I brought his old toolbox, a portable generator, and all kinds of things that we might need upon arriving there. Having not been there in ages and not knowing what we'd be walking into, it's always better to be prepared, and that's what my granddad had taught me. In the past... The few people which we had made the acquaintance of up there were all quite amiable, with everyone looking out for everyone else's well-being and property. My granddad's cabin was known, and there were never any issues with vandalism or damage of any kind any of the times I had been there. But apparently, according to the conversation I had overheard that night long ago, when I awoke from sleep, There had been some issues which my dad and granddad had experienced in the years prior to my going there with them. When we reached the cabin, the area where we parked was actually behind the cabin, and everything looked pretty much like I had remembered it so many years before. The structure appeared intact, just as I had remembered it, that is to say, until we walked around front. I knew there was a lock on the front door to which I had the key. It was a master lock run through a galvanized steel clasp. Now, there was absolutely nothing there to steal, but my granddad was a perfectionist and said that every door must have a lock, and so this door had one also. 
When we walked around to the front of the cabin, all three of the steps had been snapped cleanly in half in the middle, and the lock and clasp had been ripped right off the front door. The wood, the frame, and everything else had been visibly torn from the cabin, and the lock and clasp were actually lying on the ground with the wood and bolts still attached to it. Upon closer inspection, I could see no evidence of a pry bar having been used in this process, with no apparent damage done to the surrounding wood by any tools. The steps appeared as though something too heavy to be supported by the lumber had stepped on each one and broke them clean in two. I will also tell you that there were no claw marks or anything else that we could see surrounding the door and its frame indicative of a bear being the culprit. The guys had said that it looked like some vandals had damaged the cabin, but there was something that I had taken a mental note of, which was this. The exposed interior wood of the broken boards was still very fresh and dry. In other words, to me, this damage had occurred recently, in that the interior wood had not been exposed to the rain, snow, and weather for very long at all. It was not blackened or grayed whatsoever which is typically how untreated wood appears in such an environment as this. Even the cabin's exterior was streaked with black stains and grayed lumber on every side. This had occurred very recently, in my estimation. I could understand the lock having been torn off to gain entrance, but anyone could have seen through the windows that there was absolutely nothing inside to take. It was a bare-boned, uninsulated wood structure with no plumbing or wiring whatsoever. It was without any copper to steel or anything else. And then I thought, who would break the steps in half, which they needed to get in and out of the cabin on? It just didn't make any sense. At this point in time, we had gone into the cabin with all the steps being broken, and because the cabin's foundation had somewhat settled with a slightly forward lean through the years. Even though the lock was broken, the door was still closed, leaning against its jamb from the inside. Seeing that the rises for the stairs were still intact, we took them off the cabin, cleaned them up, and then we cut up some small saplings of similar width, cut them to length, and then by laying them side by side on the rises, we made a new set of stairs, enabling us to finally gain access to the cabin without breaking our necks in the process. Once we got in, we were immediately faced with yet another conundrum. The cabin's floor was covered with debris. I'm talking about branches and twigs covering the floor, fully consuming at least half of the cabin's floor space. The branches weren't formed into anything in particular, but there were quite a lot of them, with some of them being reasonably fresh and still green. These did not somehow randomly blow into this cabin. They had been brought in there, but the question was by whom or by what? After securing the new stairs and cleaning out the cabin, we spent the rest of the day hiking around the area. I hadn't been there in a long, long time, and the other guys obviously had never been there at all. As we hiked around, there's somewhat of a sensory overload which occurs when you come to a place such as this. The two guys I had brought along spent their days running busy auto parts stores in the metropolitan areas. While I was entrenched in the daily hustle of running around making sure my customers had everything they needed and that sales were going well. And here the three of us were in the middle of nowhere and nobody even knew we were here. Now arriving back at the cabin, we started gathering wood and cutting it up for cooking and heating. Granddad had built a campground-style barbecue set up uh, out of mortared field stones with a metal grate on top, which was still, after many years, in perfect working order. As the sun set on what was our first day, the three of us sat in the cabin, bullshitting about what a great place this was as well as rehashing the finding of the damaged stairs, the broken lock lock clasp, and the debris in the cabin. It was then that I broke the ice with the guys as far as sharing with them the conversation I heard many years early, feigning to be asleep while my dad and granddad spoke. One of the guys, Dave, said to me, 
You mean your dad saw a Bigfoot here? To which I said, I, I guess so. Dave said, wow, that's incredible. What if that sucker and its family were the ones who were inside this cabin and damaged it? I had been thinking exactly what he had just verbalized, and it was more, uh, more than a bit worrisome to me. The thought of something large enough to snap the steps in half and being able to tear the lock and clasp from the face of the cabin was not exactly comforting, as we were about to go to sleep for the night, and yet we did. In the morning after we were all awake, Trevor said during the night while you two mugs were sound asleep, I was awakened by a loud and distant scream. It sounded like a screaming witch or a woman being murdered. It sent a chill down my spine, man, and happened two successive times with each one lasting about 10 or 15 seconds. I've been lying here awake all night while you guys were sleeping. I said to him that it had to have been some type of animal, to which he said, if what I heard was an animal, I don't want to meet up with it. So we spent the day shooting skeets. One of the guys brought his machine and a couple of cases of clays, and we took turns throwing and shooting several hundred rounds until our shoulders wore out. Now, I knew of a creek running off in the woods, and I decided to take the guys over to it for a much-needed break and see if it was still running, which it was. It was close to a two-mile hike away from the cabin in some fairly open forest. On the return trip, we took a slightly different route, upon which we began to be overwhelmed by a strong stench of crap. The more we walked, the stronger it got until finally we came upon a pile of crap of mammoth proportions. This pile could have nearly filled a gallon bucket. It was fresh, and the pieces were enormous. I know this is a gross conversation, but the pieces looked very much human, but thicker and longer than ours. This stuff was not old at all similar to looking at your dog's crap in the yard from the day before. I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. It was then that Trevor started talking about the screaming which he heard during the night. And at least in his mind, he was already connecting the dots between the screams and this pile of dung. I have to admit to you, I was in total agreement with this theory, and yet I was somewhat unwilling to accept it as being fact. But that was about to change. That evening, as it was just starting to get dark, the three of us were sitting by the barbecue pit eating some hot dogs and beans when we started to hear what I would say were a bunch of owls in the woods. Here we go with the owls again, folks. It all started with one owl noise coming from one direction. Then over a period of about an hour as darkness fell, it turned into numerous owls calling from different directions within the woods. All of us were saying, man, there sure are a lot of owls around here, and we didn't hear any last night at all. Having finished our meal, we retired to the cabin for the night, and for the next 20 minutes or so, the owl sounds began to wane to the point where they had stopped altogether. As I said earlier, this cabin was bare bones. The siding consisted of rough sawn boards of various widths, nailed against a two-by-four frame. There were four wood frame windows, which couldn't be opened anymore, and we could fairly well hear anything and everything that may be going on outside of the cabin. The following day, we made up what I would call a castle door latch for the interior, We manufactured two U-shaped brackets upon which we placed a board across them to keep anything from opening the door inward. When we were outside, we left the board off, and anyone could push the door open if they wanted to gain access. This would keep us safe, relatively speaking, when inside, and would allow anyone to open the door and have a look-see without kicking the door off the jams again. It was three days later once again having retired for the night, and it was a new moon. The area surrounding the cabin was pitch black to the point where we couldn't see the hand in front of our face. 
We were inside playing cards and talking BS, as men are prone to do. At virtually the same time, we all stopped talking as our eyes were drawn to the board across the door, which had just rattled. Something had just pushed against the door gently, which made the board rattle in its holders. In other words, it was trying to door to see if it would swing open without pushing it forcefully. Trevor said, Who the hell is that? There was no reply, just silence. Thinking a bear may have just tried our door, we grabbed the guns and sat watching and waiting. Two of us had grabbed flashlights, which we shined through the windows in an attempt to see something, but we saw nothing. None of us were about to remove the board and exit the cabin into this pitch-black darkness, especially not knowing what may be waiting on the other side. Unfortunately, none of the windows allowed us a direct view in front of the door, and they were so clouded from dirt and age, they were virtually useless anyway. It was 11 p.m. when the first rock hit the roof. Now, the roof on this cabin was made of corrugated metal. Large sheets were nailed down to the roof rafters, overlapping each other to keep out of the weather. When the rock hit the roof, it sounded like a hardball hitting a metal garbage can with the sound reverberating within the cabin. We all started shouting and cursing at whoever threw it, yelling that we're going to blow your ass away, and the like, things like that. And then the second and third rocks hit the roof. That's when the pelting began. The cabin's roof and outer walls were being bombarded with what sounded like rocks and wood. From inside, we thought it was coming from one side and the rear of the cabin when suddenly one of the rear-facing windows was blown out with the mullions and the glass showering into the cabin's interior. Dave was the first to start firing. The first two shots went through the broken window while he stood in the middle of the cabin. Then, grabbing a box of shells and emptying them in his jacket pocket, he stood right in the open window and began blasting round after round in different directions into the darkness. <clears throat> while Dave was pumping rounds off one after the other, Trevor and I got the nuts to swing the door open, and we both began shelling the area in front and around the cabin, pumping again round after round into the darkness. Between the three of us, we must have sent 200 rounds into the night. And, uh... Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Sorry, Kev. Sorry, folks. Nope. No one problem. page was One page was stuck to the back of the other one. <laughs> uh, into the darkness before we stopped shooting, and then everything was dead silent. During this whole melee, we saw and heard nothing in the form of figures or screams or anything. We were simply shooting blindly in the hope of killing or scaring whatever was responsible for this attack in the cabin. For the rest of the night, the three of us stood guard at the door and the window, and if we heard so much as a twig snap, we started firing again until the sunlight came. As soon as it was light enough to see, we all exited, began to survey the area. We could see dozens of stones around the cabin, which hadn't been there the day before, and chunks of logs laying in the grass around the perimeter of the structure. We thought for sure that there would have been something lying dead around the property, or at the very least a blood trail, but we found nothing of that nature. What we did find next was rather remarkable. There were numerous areas where we could plainly see large impressions of big feet on the spongy ground, both in the sparser areas of the surrounding grass as well as in the peat by the forest edges. The footprints were of a variety of sizes in both length and width, all of them very large and human-like. They were fresh, hadn't been washed out by any sort of weather had they been older in their creation. After seeing the huge footprints, all of us were in agreement that we were the victims of a Bigfoot attack on the cabin. There was no doubt about it. Having said all of this, I know what it is to be skeptical. I've been on the other side of the fence myself. But what I've told you happened to us, and it could have happened to you or anyone else. 
Whether or not you believe me is no particular importance to me either. We had the living crap scared out of us that night. And having left the cabin the following day, I will never return to it again as long as I live. The events also showed me these creatures are fairly ignorant, and I'll tell you why. If you believe, as I do, that they were responsible for snapping the three steps in half, it would be akin to you or me stepping on a weakened staircase, feeling a step give way, and continuing to walk up the stairs. And yet this creature did it three times. If you also consider that we've been firing guns and making a racket up there for days, they obviously had no fear of approaching us in the darkness of night, knowing we possessed at the very least loud noisemakers, even if they were unaware of the notion of being shot. That's it, Kev. What do you think of that? That's amazing. So basically, they were away from this cabin and the very northernmost part of Maine, and uh, it looks like a Bigfoot moved in. And then when yeah, they and came back, right, that's, uh, all hell broke loose. Yeah, taking care of, uh, you know, taking advantage of some shelter. Sure. And uh, like he said initially, when they saw this debris in the cabin, some of it looked fresh. Yeah. So it was being kept up or, you know, fluffing up the bed, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't heard an account like that, but it's not hard to believe, especially out in, uh, you know, a, a place like the very northernmost part of Maine, right? So rural. And these cabins, or as they call them, fish camps, are all over the state. Yeah, uh, you know, it's just, it's incredible that there are still places. See, again, I stick to my guns that, People think that, you know, you live in a city or suburbia, like there ain't no Bigfoot around. Yeah, but you don't live in northern Maine near the Canadian border, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. There's, there's nothing, nothing up, up there. there. <laughs> there's nothing It's there wild, though. The, the other thing that's really weird, and I know you said, here we go, folks, with the bunch of owls. I mean, owls don't hang out together, as far as I know. Like, I, I think they're pretty territorial. You know, like they... They uh, like we have one here where our yard uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, is part of its territory. And I see them once in a while and I see them, you know, half a mile up the street sometimes at night. And my understanding is that's like one owl has a territory. You're not going to see a flock of owls hanging out together. No, no, they are territorial. Yeah. And I'm with you. Uh, I have a little screech owl that hangs around the house. We've seen him a couple of times. And I also have a great horn sneaking in here. Mm. And I hear that bugger once in a while, and a couple of times really close to the house. It's very loud. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I saw right. one just uh, last week in my backyard um, in, a, in a maple. And I came out at night, and I just felt like something was there. And then he jumped off of the branch and kind of flew across the yard. And you know what they say about the owls there. Something about them where they're completely silent when they fly, and this guy was like no sound at all. Yeah, super I cool. Saw, I, I saw. I uh, saw uh, one day years ago. I went over to Connecticut Park, and one of these naturalists was there with some of these wounded birds that can never oh, yeah. go in the woods again. Yeah, uh, she had a great horn on her arm, and uh, she told us that the feather design on them is uh, really, for lack of a better term, kind of fluffy on the edges. Ah, okay. It makes zero sound. Yeah, this. They got the early version of stealth uh, yeah. technology. Stealth The original bird. stealth fighter. <laughs> now, one other thing she, uh, they had said was also this, that they, the owl's feathers don't have any oil on them. Hmm. And if they get caught in heavy rain for a period of time, uh, they can get soaked to the core and suffer from things like hypothermia and whatnot and actually die. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Yeah, because, you know, the birds in your yard, like my birds fly around here in the rain and everything. Yeah. You know, they come to the feeders when it's raining and they get wet. I don't know you what got, You got those waterproof birds, Bill. <laughs> 
You sure they don't have L.L. Bean jackets on or something? It's called a bean bird. <laughs> awesome. Crazy, huh, with the uh, pelting of the cabin and... Uh, I, you know, I can't imagine being in an insecure place like that. Yeah. Uh, in pitch black, you can't really go out because anything could be there. Uh, you got some type of lighting in the cabin so they could see where you are inside, <laughs> relatively speaking. But you have no idea where whatever it is that's throwing all this stuff is on the outside. Oh, no idea. Yeah. So uh, agree, agree. 100%. I've been there. I've been there in pitch blackness, and it's just like wow, man. You feel like your eyes are going to get focused, and they never do. No, they never <laughs> do. Yeah, <laughs> I've done it too, where you hold your hand up in front of your face, and literally you can't see your hand in front of your face, like the old yeah. saying goes. Yeah, and that's kind of frightening. Uh, it is. It is. You're not used to it. So that's all it, right, man. Bill. Well, we got some cool listener mail this week uh, that runs the gamut. gamut. We're going to start out with uh, uh, one of our field reporters, Jordan in Michigan, responding to one of the questions we asked in uh, a recent podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the subject is Fort Custer. You remember that, Bill? Yes, yes, yes. And, yeah, Jordan writes, Hey, KJ and WJ, I was listening to your Michigan Dogman episode, and I live in Augusta, Michigan, which is about three to five minutes away from where that woman's sighting was back in 2000. And Jordan says, Granted, I was only born around then, and I haven't seen one personally, but I've always been interested in Bigfoot and Dogman. And he says, As for Fort Custer... It is indeed an armored division headquarters. Um, and he says it's also home to the Fort Custer Recreational Area. Um, so thank you, Jordan. Remember, Bill, you were asking the audience, if you know what what's going on at Fort Custer, let us know. Yeah. yeah. See, and it's interesting, too, because uh, my thoughts are that uh, these Bigfoot are obviously territorial, right? They have places they live or go. But it seems to me that at these bases where there may be heavy armament activity at times, yeah. vehicles running through the woods, these may be times when these creatures get spooked. Yeah, they scare them out. Now, this is a dog man, of course, uh, near Fort Custer. So, yeah, I don't know if dog man gets spooked. <laughs> I, I think generally they are the spooker. <laughs> but that's just my theory oh well, yeah you might be right <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you jordan for writing in and letting us know about fort custer and the next one is pretty interesting bill it comes from barry in tennessee and he, barry writes i'm a firm believer in bigfoot but i'm frustrated with folks that seem compelled to create hoax sightings of the creature. What percentage of Bigfoot sightings do you think are hoaxers? And do you think there are more folks dressing up in furry suits than there are imitating other cryptids? Thanks for your thoughts, Barry. Yeah. What do you think, Bill? Well, I just sent you over a couple that came in this morning, and I'll use them as an example. Uh, in the first one, the guy's sitting in a tree stand with a rifle. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's kind of quiet, doing a little quiet, talking into the microphone, and there's this thing walking around. To me, it looked like a guy in a suit. Right. I mean, my, that was my first impression. Right. The second one linked to this uh, mail that was sent to me was that of a tree-shaking episode, apparently... Uh, footage taken from a drone and some guy taking it apart, you know, talking about it. Uh, that also looked fake to me. Uh, some type of CG. And, you know, my reason for saying that was that the drones today, Kev, take excellent pictures. Oh, yeah. I have one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there was no need for any blurriness or fogginess continually oh, on no. a well a well lit nice day looking down at what was going on. Yeah. So both of them, to me, were fake. 
And to answer your question, I think a large piece of what we see on YouTube and whatnot is fake. And the people are just trying to drum it up and get viewership and get advertised and then turn a dollar every month. But uh, once in a while, I see one that just hits me. Uh, and I say, man, that's freaking legit. Oh, I agree, Bill. I mean, like if you cornered me to put a number, I would say, Barry, greater than 50 percent are fake. Yeah. You know, based on what I've seen out there. The thing that compels me is how long some of these things go back in time, like some of them we talked about today earlier in the podcast. And we've talked about them through our 120 podcasts out there. So and and I'm more skeptical, you know, when people are doing the YouTube thing and they're trying to jump drum up their ad business and stuff like that. You know, it's it's very obvious in the modern day with YouTube, for example, that people have ulterior motives compared to going back early in time. Right. So. Right. And listen, uh, look, so some people would say to me, well, hey, WJ, you sell books. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's how I get the stories out there. But also remember this. I work for a living. <laughs> so, so that'll tell you something right there. Yeah. You know, this is this is not my sole source of uh, income. And of course, I want to see you purchase books. It shows me that you like what we're doing and sure. you have interest in the topic. Uh, yeah, and and I mean, getting back to his, Barry's last part, part of his question, too, which I think is interesting. You know, do you think there's more hoaxers with Bigfoot than some of the other cryptids? I do think so. You know, I, I, I don't I don't know that somebody's swimming around in Lake Champlain looking like a giant sea serpent. You know, I just don't <laughs> think so. Um, but it is very reasonable to think somebody's faking footprints in the forest or something like that. You know, right. So. You know. You remember, again, I got to go back to our buddy Les Straub. I'd love to talk to that guy someday, but I guess some of these people are very elusive. Uh, but he did <laughs> He's that a bit big, of a Bigfoot himself. Yeah. Uh, he did that uh, study paying some guys to make uh, very, very realistic footprints on sti- uh, feet, Bigfoot feet on stilts yep. that he could walk with. And like he said, it would just be so ridiculous to get them on, walk in any way, shape, or form through snow or loose soil or mud and be able to cover up your tracks. <laughs> it's just was like so ridiculous to attempt such a thing that, uh, you know, if you have these uh, tracks going off for long distances, many, many footprints, it, it's almost impossible, you know. No, I'm it's with just... you. I'm with you, Bill. All right. Well, we're going to shift gears into the fun. Um, so Joe, Joe didn't say where he was from, but he sent in some links related to Andre the Giant and uh, Steve <laughs> Austin and the Six Million Dollar Man. And Bill, did you get to watch any of these? Well, th- what what got me about all of this, Kev, was I never thought there would be such an outpouring. I know. Oh. Everybody's writing in about this. But last <laughs> night I was watching, and folks, I am putting both the little snippet of the Six Million Dollar Man um, up on our uh, website, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com, under episode 120, there's a little snippet of the $6 million man, Steve Austin, tearing the arm off of what is Andre <laughs> the Giant dressed up like Bigfoot. And Bill, it is hysterical. He pulls the arm <laughs> off and the sparks come flying out of it. I guess it's supposed to be like... A, um, a robot or something, but it's the old. It's fantastic. And then Joe gives us the link to the entire episode uh, from NBC.com. So I'm going to post that as well, folks. You can go and watch the entire episode, uh, which I did last night um, for free without any special app or anything. And it is fantastic. And now don't get me wrong. Fantastic in a goofy, corny way, you know, because it's old. (laughs) Don't expect amazing special effects, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the thing is, Kev, like 
I never watched the Six Million Dollar Man because to me it was really corny. Oh yeah. But then, then I had to think to myself, well, in the sixties, I used to watch the Man from Uncle, Batman. Oh man, and Batman me, to, is awesome. Yeah, but t- to me, they were so cool. And yet, when I watch them now, talk about corny. Oh man, Batman was the corniest. That was. <laughs> Uh, my daughter, folks, got me, I think it was last Christmas or the Christmas before, the boxed set, complete box set of DVDs of the original Adam West Batman series. And if you remember Batman, boy, you gotta you should go buy this on Amazon. I don't I don't get any of the proceeds, of course, but it's got every episode in it, um, and it is just hysterical. When you go back, <laughs> you forget about some of these uh, villains that he was up against. Of course, you remember the penguin and stuff like that. But there's some really goofy ones, too. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Freeze. Mr. Freeze. Yeah. but And the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, the Riddler, uh, you know. Yeah. How about uh, uh, Egghead? Egghead. Exactly. Remember him? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Egg exactly. Excruciating. <laughs> excruciating. That wasn't corny, <laughs> Bill. All right. Our last letter tonight comes from Mike in Chicago. And the subject is, it's a bird, it's a plane, or is it Mothman? Uh-huh. And he says, what do you guys think about the plethora of Mothman sightings in and around Chicago O'Hare Airport? The images and evidence are compelling, especially in one of the busiest airspaces in the world. Very strange. I am very interested in your thoughts. Mike. What do you think of that, Kev? Hi, Bill. I don't know what to think because there are a ton of sightings. And, you know, some of the video and imagery of what looks like, you know, this Delta-winged Mothman flying over suburban Chicago in the daytime with crystal clear video. I don't know what to think, Bill. And there are hundreds of sightings. It's not like one or two. Hundreds of them. Yeah, uh, you know, I hate to fall prey to the very things that I warn about, uh, but I can't help thinking that somebody out there is setting this up, flying something around and filming it in different locations. No, and that's what uh, I would think too, Bill, if it was out in the desert or in Maine or something. But this is like one of the busiest airspaces in the world. Yeah, no, it's very bizarre. And the thing looks big, you know. I'd I'd like to have an encounter. I'd like to have an encounter of somebody who sees this thing sitting yes. on their uh, their uh, elevated uh, deck or patio, whatever you call it, on an uh, apartment, you know. That's right. Yeah, I any mean, of you folks like, like you, Mike, around Chicago, write in and tell us what you've seen. You know, like we always right. say, if you see something, say something, you know. Um, this this one is really interesting. There's so many sightings. We did cover it in a previous podcast, but I think we're going to cover it again. Maybe we'll do an update on it because it's yeah, pretty know, wild. Anything that flies has to land. Exactly. So my point is I'd like to get something else besides all of these in-flight uh, shots. I'd like to get some landing, perching on a tree, Somebody who's heard audible uh, audio from it, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see some additional data come in uh, on this uh, purported creature. Yeah, maybe perched on your railing of your deck in your backyard. Not yeah. my deck, but your deck. Yeah. Or landing on the <laughs> l- landing on the hood of your '62 V Dub. Oh. I think it might, <laughs> might do some damage there. <laughs> Unbelievable. Fantastic cool. well, well, that's it, Bill. That's it this week. Great account. Uh, some good history of Bigfoot and some fantastic listener mail. So uh, that's it, folks. Thank you. And thanks for your support of my brother and his bride as well and praying for her. Yes, thanks a lot, folks. Appreciate it. And remember, if you should find yourself 
wandering around the woods of northern Maine, or anywhere else for that matter. You better heed my words. Always carry more gun than you think you're gonna need. Sleep tight.